Welcome. I'm Jeff Lightfoot, the Program Director for Europe at the Center for International Private Enterprise and the Director of SIPE's new Europe office based here in Bratislava. I'm very pleased to welcome you today, along with our partner and co-host, the Central European Institute for Asian Studies, for a discussion on the topic of corrosive capital in Central Europe and how the private sector can work with the public sector and civil society to address this challenge. For those of you who are new to SIPE or to our discussions about corrosive and constructive capital, SIPE is a core institute of the United States' National Endowment for Democracy and a, and a nonprofit affiliate of the US Chamber of Commerce that works to support private sector actors across the globe who champion democratic reform. We work with and we support business associations, economic think tanks, and civil society groups. Just this month, SIPE has opened and launched its new Europe office based here in Bratislava with the goal of expanding our work in Central Europe at the intersection of markets and democracy. One of our priorities in Europe will be the topic of corrosive capital, which is a major theme of SIPE programming around the world. SIPE has defined corrosive capital as financing, whether state or private, that lacks transparency, accountability, and market orientation. It typically originates from authoritarian regimes and it exploits governance gaps to influence policymaking. We also thought it was useful at SIPE to contrast this with the concept of constructive capital, which we define as capital flows that are governed by market principles. Constructive capital results in the creation of added value for recipient economies, while at the same time promoting principles of good governance, free markets, and accountability. There's a depth of research looking at the topic of corrosive capital in Central Europe and how governments should address the problem. But at SIPE, we believe there was a shortage of research looking at this issue from the perspective of the private sector and in particular, the topic of how the business community could play an active role as a key pillar in civil society in addressing this challenge that has huge implications for democracies in this region. Today's panel features the authors of a series of papers in CIPAS Commission, in which the Central European Institute for Asian Studies edited, looking at case studies of corrosive capital in Central Europe and outlining recommendations for how the business community can work with local government and civil society to address the challenge. And we're really grateful to Maciej Szymalczyk uh, and his team at CEIAS for spearheading this project, um, and we're really pleased with the results. You can find those papers on the website of CEIAS.eu or on the SIPE website as well. And I know my colleague, uh, Caitlin, who's sort of uh, administering this call, will post uh, links to the Corrosive and Constructive Capital website on SIPE's site and to the CEIAS site. And the papers look at case studies of corrosive capital and solutions to address it in Croatia, Romania, Bulgaria, Czechia and Slovakia, and Latvia. And for today's discussion, I'm pleased that we have three of the paper drafters here who I'm very happy to introduce. Uh, first will be Maciej Szymalczyk, who's the executive director of CEIAS, the editor of the paper series, author of the paper on Czechia and Slovakia, and as we learned last week, the newest member of the Forbes 30 under 30 network here in Slovakia. Uh, Romina Filipova is the chairperson of the Institute for Global Analytics in Sofia, and author of the paper on Romania, Bulgaria. And Nina Pijic is a junior researcher at the University of Ljubljana who has authored the paper on Croatia. If you go online, you'll see there's a fourth paper looking at Russian instances of corrosive capital in Latvia by Evia Jakovica, but unfortunately, due to a scheduling conflict, she couldn't make today's event, but I would encourage you to give it a read on our website. Um, so I look forward to moderating a discussion to follow with these three drafters about their papers. What I'll do is I'll throw some opening questions to the panel to start the conversation to let them really present some of their key findings and recommendations. And then I'll open the floor to questions from the audience, um, from each of you. And I ask you, you don't have to wait for you know, the end of the presentations. Please feel free to put questions into the chat function at the bottom. You can start right away. We do ask that uh, people putting questions identify themselves and their, their affiliation with an institution. Um, and just as a reminder from, from a housekeeping perspective that today's event is being recorded and will be available on the SIPE website. So uh, today's conversation is considered on the record. But without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and, and, and throw the floor to Maciej with maybe an opening question. Um, you know, Maciej, thanks again for your, your assistance in, in all the good work of CIS and pulling this uh, initiative together. We're proud to co-host this with you. Um, you pull no punches in, in the title of your paper, uh, Oligarchs and Party Folks, where you give a pretty sweeping overview of the past activities of corrosive capital in Czechia and Slovakia. I think a couple of interesting themes come out. You talked to the, the subject of elite capture 
by corrosive capital investors, um, the challenge of Chinese influence in the academia, academia sector of both countries. Can you maybe orient us, give us some prominent examples of how corrosive capital captured elites in the Czech and Slovak markets and perhaps give us a sense of some of the regulatory governance weaknesses in both the public and private sector that allowed this kind of elite capture to take hold. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff, for the kind introduction and uh, providing an overview of what we've been doing over the summer with this uh, series of papers on authoritarian corrosive capital um, in the Central and Eastern European countries. Um, basically, I'll be speaking now about very specific issues relating to Chinese corrosive capital in Slovakia and the uh, Czech Republic, which goes back to the, one of the papers that I wrote. Uh, of course, there's much more than uh, just Chinese corrosive capital happening in the region. Uh, Russian corrosive capital features prominently as well, but uh, that uh, hopefully we'll be able to cover that in some uh, newer editions later. Uh, but, but for now, we are sticking to the Chinese one, which is something that I've been uh, focusing on for uh, quite a few years now. Uh, and it's a very peculiar situation when we are discussing Chinese corrosive capital in both Czech Republic and Slovakia, because on one hand, we see that statistically speaking, both countries have very low economic dependency on China. Um, investment amount to less than 1% of overall uh, FDI stock in those countries. Um, trade is more mostly uh, Chinese uh, exports to these countries. So uh, the dependence is maybe reversed in this case and, uh, and uh, exports from either Czech Republic or Slovakia are quite, quite limited actually mostly to outputs produced by uh, other foreign investors located in both uh, Slovakia and Czech Republic, mostly in the automotive uh, industry. Nevertheless, actually we've seen um, since 2010, 2012 uh, and input or, or influx of uh, Chinese corporate capital in the region uh, due to uh, basically uh, which is tied basically to um, the starting of the 17 plus one platform and the Northern Road Initiative, which kind of launched Chinese interest um, in the broader Central Eastern European uh, region, uh, Czech Republic being one of the more uh, prominent uh, actors in this uh, regard. Um, when we were mapping actually the various uh, cases of Chinese corporate capital in both Czech Republic and Slovakia and, and the effects they have on good governance, uh, we noticed uh, basically two very interesting findings. Firstly, uh, we see that uh, in these two countries, Chinese corrosive capital is actually not a country specific issue, but rather a transnational one, because we often see, as the title suggests of the paper, that uh, it often relies on uh, existing oligarchic networks, with, which tend to uh, operate transnationally uh, out of Prague and Bratislava. Uh, focusing on both mar markets uh, as a legacy of the uh, long history of the two countries being uh, joined as part of uh, Czechoslovakia. In the past. Um, secondly, when we are looking at uh, the specific effects of uh, Chinese corporate capital on, on good governance um, in the two countries, we see that uh, basically these effects can be uh, grouped into three specific clusters. First, we have the first problem is that Thanks to Chinese credit capital, uh, China has been able to purchase critical assets in the region. Secondly, we see that this leads to uh, elite capture by uh, fostering uh, non-transparent ties to local elites, be it in politics, uh, business, or even academia. And, and third, thirdly, uh, we see that this credit capital is used to uh, manage discourse about China. Um, I'll go one by one on these issues. And, and first, when we look in the critical assets problem, we see that a lot of this has been uh, tied to the uh, presence of the CEFC company uh, in Czech Republic and Slovakia, which as one of its biggest purchases, purchased uh, almost 10% stake in uh, one of the largest uh, financial groups operating in both countries, the JNT Group, which of course owns many companies on, in various sectors. More interestingly, it owns companies in the media, banking and telecom industries. Um, so CEFC was a rather peculiar case as this company was operating very uh, transparently and actually when it tried to uh, increase its uh, capital share on JNT Finance Group uh, up to 50%, it was actually blocked by the Czech National Bank over uh, low, low transparency of the financial sources. Um, nevertheless, we've seen a very uh, problematic issue here. So for example, in the media sector, when we have seen that when CFC had purchased uh, several media in the Czech Republic, 
um, those have actually uh, turned to, on, to uh, reporting only very positive uh, pictures about China. Uh, so, so we've seen this in case of the Tiden magazine or Berendo television, um, which actually ties to the third problem that I mentioned, that, that these investments uh, and financial ties are used to manage discourse about China. Uh, this was also a possibility of happening in Slovakia as well, when there was something uh, going on with the largest TV station, Markiza, where this company wanted to, to buy it, but in the end, it didn't go through. Um, and maybe even bigger issue was its uh, involvement in the telecom industry, when actually uh, the JNT group with the, with the, with the financial um, influx of, of, from CFC has actually uh, invested in one of the venture capital funds or, or private equity funds. Uh, which actually invested into the telecom company Swan, which in turn manages the governmental uh, telecommunication network, which is a pretty big problem when, when you uh, look at this from the point of view of, uh, of uh, cybersecurity. Um, a specific issue that I mentioned in the beginning is actually elite capture. And, and again, uh, Chinese companies that have been investing in the Czech Republic and Slovakia uh, tie into this uh, pretty well. Um, in the beginning, they were actually uh, relying quite a big bit, uh, not only on these uh, oligarchs and financial groups, but also on, uh, on uh, local politicians that turned into lobbyists and, and so forth. So we've seen that, they, uh, that the various Chinese entities had on their payroll, for example, a former Minister of Defense in Czech Republic, former EU commissioner, and so forth. And this has actually highlighted the problem with the revolving door regulations in the region, uh, where actually we see that some of these politicians have managed to swap their role several times, like, like leaving the government and starting to work as lobbyists for these Chinese companies, and then later on returning back to government as, for example, the current Czech foreign minister. Um, and and the, a very specific issue here was also uh, maybe let's call it uh, creation of various financial dependencies on uh, Chinese markets. And this is a very interesting case with a home credit group, which is a, uh, which is a micro lender, uh, Czech company owned by the PTF group, which is also active on the Chinese uh, market. And actually uh, the home credit company generates over half of its revenue in the Chinese market. And, but in order to be able to operate on this market, it has to, uh, it has to gain a banking license uh, from a Chinese regulator, which of course is a very politically problematic issue. And to this end, the company has actually uh, managed to influence the presidential foreign policy in Czech Republic in such a way that it actually completely uh, avoided for several years any mention of critical uh, issues regarding China, such as human rights, uh, environment, and so forth, and, and uh, was uh, really this uh, hardline pragmatist foreign policy. Um, Lastly, and uh, I will return back here with a discourse uh, management issue, it does not relate only to media, of course, and the uh, academic environment is very important uh, aspect here. So uh, we've actually seen that Chinese uh, companies or right, Chinese entities have been able to finance uh, academic uh, courses at universities over the past few years or provide money for, uh, for very important uh, policy conferences which of course raises the problem that this can uh, influence the uh, topics covered on this co at these conferences or, or the way the discourse is shaped about them. Uh, a notable case was, for example, in the Czech Republic where actually Chinese embassy was funding a very specific course at uh, the Charles University on the Belt and Road Initiative. And uh, several um, sources indicate that this was a very positively covered uh, topic in these courses without any critical discussions about the about uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. Of course, uh, funding can come uh, to this academic environment not only from Chinese embassy or from Chinese businesses, but also very specific issue is here, the role of that Confucius Institutes play uh, in the academic environment. And we've seen, for example, that they've been used, uh, they've been using this funding to uh, create uh, dependencies uh, across the universities in Slovak Republic on uh, China-related education. So currently, based almost all uh, academic, uh, all university-level education about China is somehow uh, funded or supported by Confucius Institutes. And uh, several anecdotal evidence reveals that um, these courses, in the end, do not actually raise in any way any of the problematic issues. And very recently, uh, ourselves in the TEA, we've seen that that raising uh, this question about uh, how academic, uh, how academic and entities are dealing with China can provoke a lot of backlash from Confucius Institutes when we ourselves face some sort of uh, threats from one of these uh, Confucius Institutes. 
Um, so, so anyway, this has been a very, uh, very fast bird eye view of, uh, of uh, Chinese cars of capital in both Slovakia and Czech Republic. And there's uh, one thing to take away from it is sort of that uh, often it relies on uh, uh, business interests of local, local actors, specifically uh, oligarchy groups, uh, and it ties pretty well with the, the already established domestic uh, corruption networks. Um, and in the specific case of Czech Republic and Slovenia, it, op it operates on a strong transnational basis rather than on a purely uh, national one. Thanks, Maciej, very much for that really good overview. There's, there's just a lot there to unpack, and, and I think is we'll, we'll get to as these subsequent uh, discussions move along, there's just so many overlapping threads among these papers. I, I'd like to turn next to Nina as we, as we go look at the Croatian context, where you explore the theme of corrosive capital there. I, I saw in my reading of it almost a tale of two stories, and you'll have to tell me if you're wrong, of, of great success, I, I guess I'd say, in terms of uh, Chinese investment in the region, and followed by a, really a sort of a string of disappointments and failures. So, yeah, the first is a case study of the Pelyasak Bridge, um, which is a, sort of a flagship incidence of Chinese infrastructure involvement in, in Southeast Europe. Uh, that it'd be interesting if you can unpack sort of how that came about, but pretty high profile, got a lot of attention, you know, including in American media. Uh, but, but then you also profile a bunch of much less, I think, well-known incidences of largely failed business deals that left a lot of disappointment in Croatia. You point to uh, Agricor, for example, and the, the attempted bailout there. Despite a lot of rhetoric and hyped announcements by both uh, Croatian and Chinese officials, um, it's, it seems in reading your paper, my, my understanding is a fundamental weakness of the business and investment environment in Croatia forms sits at the background of the corrosive capital story in both cases. But I wonder if you could talk to those examples and orient us to how you see corrosive capital playing out in the Croatian context. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. That's such a nice introduction into the conclusions of this paper. Um, I would say that it connects to Matej's case or what Matej presented in Czech Republic, in Slovak Republic, in two kind of yeah strong points. First is that there is a clear lack of foreign basically foreign direct in, uh, FBI's in Croatia. And this is why there exists this need that they, that both the businesses and the government in this bigger kind of public calls projects um, consider this, this bigger investments as an additional source of money. They don't feel the need to, to check or to um, gather more intelligence information about the sources of the money, about the foreign investors, uh, the sources of the capital involved. And the second is that the same circle of people engages with the potential um, Chinese investors in Croatia. So the same circle of local oligarchs or, or former politicians and so on. But to take it from the beginning, from the top, um, you can say similarly to other countries in this part of Europe, there were quite stale economic relations between China and Croatia until the arrival of the 17 plus one initiative. When the 17 plus one initiative arrived, there were quite a, a number of memorandums of, of understanding uh, concluded also in the field of investment, on the field in the field of economic cooperation and so on. And of course, we had some additional, some uh, bigger projects um, being either proposed from the Chinese side, or as you said, in the case of Pelješac Bridge, projects with really big regional impact that left uh, the mark on the whole, um, yeah, the whole of Europe. So to go directly into the Pelješac Bridge project. So this is a project that had big financial difficulties um, since 2007 when it was first proposed. And why is it important? It's important because Croatia has a part of a country that is dislocated. You have to cross Bosnia and Herzegovina to get to Dubrovnik, which is a major attraction. A lot of tourism is there. The tourist sector is growing there year by year and so on. So what Croatia wanted to do is uh, set a bridge from their own side to the uh, kind of the, the peninsula that goes along the coast of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is also Croatian. So this peninsula and kind of cross this distance uh, in order for the tourists and for the locals, uh, in order for them to escape that uh, this path through Bosnia and Herzegovina and this a couple of 
couple of kilometers that they had to pass, exit the country and enter again to reach this enclave that Croatia had, has in Dubrovnik. So this bridge has been in plans, has been in plan for quite some time now. And when the talks materialized, um, they came up. So the government presented the idea that the EU Commission will finance 85% of the whole project, and it did. So they created a public call uh, where 85% of the project is financed by the by the EU Commission, but the rest is financed by the government. And three consortia, three very big consortia applied to this call, a Chinese one, um, an Austrian Italian one, and Turkish one. And the Chinese one um, won this project um, with big differences in pricing. And this is the main source of the problem, basically. This project is marked with two lawsuits for price dumping from the beginning, where the consortia, the other, consor the other two consortia claims that it is practically impossible to build roads, to build several parts of this bridge at such low costs. And here the experts that analyze this specific case say that it is very likely that the project behind the, 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 the behind the project, behind the Chinese consortia, you have one of the Chinese banks that are partially financing this global outreach of the Chinese consortia. And this is why they can afford such low prices. The government of Croatia dismissed those claims. And of course, everything and the, the, these um, lawsuits kind of, they went by pretty quickly. The government did not want to stop the procedure um, or the work to wait for the results. And yeah, nothing really happened. So there are no, the, the, uh, the bridge is almost built and it is officially the first project uh, built by the Chinese in Europe. Uh, that is financed by the EU funding, public funding. So this is why this, this bridge has such, it's, it's such an infamous uh, case across Europe, but as I understood Jeff also in the US, it's because uh, besides the claims that there is price dumping behind it, there are also other speculations that could really um, kind of endanger the whole European construction sector in the long run. Because why would the Chinese consortium want to dump pricing to basically gain experience to get the receive the funding, be selected on the public call, but then to um, yeah, to have experience, relevant reference points to apply for other public calls in neighboring countries that have similar needs and similar um, yeah, environment, circumstances, and yeah, to work further there. And this is problematic because the Chinese capabilities are quite high in construction and uh, it could lead to a demise of the European construction sector if we are being yeah, very, um, yeah, very, yeah, if we are looking a bit on the dark side of the whole story. The second thing that is connected to the Pilishad's bridge problem is the, um, that the, the civil society was kind of loud already in advance through media. They were alarming the government that it, it needs to prevent possible labor rights violations in Croatia. So there were, there were even um, reports. There was an original plan uh, that was... Um, presented by the media that the Chinese consortium building the bridge will have a boat uh, shipped right out in the international part of the Adriatic Sea, and they would ship the workers every day to work on the bridge. And yeah, it, it, I guess the, uh, the civil society was quite alarmed that it would, um, that the Chinese consortium would engage in some kind of labor rights violations, beside the fact that they were um, pointing out that there would be little local market uh, labor force involved in the project. And it turned out to be the case. So there were uh, significant labor violations happening and the consortium was fined, but yeah, still it was selected and it conducted the, the infrastructure, the construction of the bridge. Then this, let's say the, the second part of the problem and it comes out, it is very visible in these two other cases that are maybe less 
well known when it comes to the Chinese investment into Croatia is connected to this need to receive a bigger influx of foreign capital. And it, it materializes in many futile projects that once the ones that, that, that they are kind of presented as futile as well, they have little, uh, little um, potential to ever return to the market. This is a case with a former political school. Uh, it's, a, it's a very old building near Zagreb, Kumrovets. It's called Josip Brostitos Political School. Uh, it was turned to the hotel in the meantime, but previously in Yugoslavia, it was a place where these Yugoslav officials would go and learn about international relations theory and so on. So um, we have a Chinese investor who stipulated, uh, who, who, who purchased this building and wanted to turn it into a wellness resort. Um, and they had several other plans and they never came through with the payment. So even today, the government is still waiting for their payment. And this has been the case in the last several years. And this part, so this investment is just stagnating and it's uh, being even more torn down than it was before, right? So even though that the local administration wanted to find a solution for this big part of their local um, territory, right? This is because they didn't, check the background of the investor and the reliability of the capital that the investment investor is bringing, um, it is still stagnating and it will likely never move forward. It will always be kind of stuck in these bureaucratic uh, procedures. And yeah, it will basically, Croatia is losing potential in this, this way, right? Um, moreover, um, when you come, when you look at who stipulates these agreements, those that are economically futile, you can see that these are always the same people. For example, the uh, the one the person who stipulated this agreement is, is uh, Stepan Mesic, and the website of the investor even brags about it. Right, that uh, Stepan Mesic helped to stipulate a couple of agreements in Croatia and so on. Mm, and he's a former president of the Republic of Croatia. And when it comes to the, uh, the local director of the subsidiary of the Chinese investor in Croatia, he, it's Mar Mario Rindulic, he's the same person who um, also stipulated several other dead ends investors, um, in, the investments in Croatia, like the investment into Port Zadar, which also had a whole corruption scandal behind it. And I also write about it in the paper. Um, again, the investor, they did not, uh, the, the investor did not um, kind of oblige to local regulations. Um, and again, it filed several lawsuits. And again, this is still uh, an issue not resolved when it comes yeah, so when it comes to Port Zadar, when it comes to the former political school uh, cases, they are both stagnating and it seems that there is no way out because the investor that was brought into the country by the local um, yeah, former politicians or uh, just members of yeah, business society, uh, again, the, always the same people, um, yeah, these investments never came through. They never came through, and this is why a large part of Croatia, and when you look at the investments that, Ch that the Chinese private companies are making in Croatia, they, these are not so successful uh, investments. So I was looking for some successful cases as well, but there are very few, there are around five, something like this. So I would say that there is a big problem, like you said, Jeff, with the just general, bad economic or investment environment in Croatia that is not stipulating transparency, it is not stipulating, you know, that uh, every private company, every local administrator has to do due diligence and has to be transparent about who the investor is, where the capital is coming from, what are the plans with the projects and so on. So that is one big problem, I would say, in the from the side of Croatia. Also, you know, um, uh, surrounding yourself with um, same associations that have same people in all the time and um, even though you know that these this same people uh, stipulated really overall bad investments into the country is not a good way forward. Um, yes, um, so 
let me just stop here and I will answer maybe some other more specific uh, questions, but to basically take take anything out of if you want to take anything out of them out of this whole story in Croatia and Chinese investments in Croatia is that there are not a lot of them and that most of them are not economically futile in one case or another. And those that remain are, some are successful cases, of course, but some are also, um, mm, let's say, the, the, the doubt in that the, they were made in a correct and transparent manner is so big that um, Croatia is, yeah, in general, that Croatia really has to pay attention to not uh, create even worse investment environment for itself, right? On all levels. So we will look at that in recommendations, I guess, but yeah, this is all from my side. Yeah, thanks very much, Nina. I think we're seeing, you know, in your uh, overview and that of Maci, some, some sort of key themes already emerging, right? When we talk about like elite capture, I think are, are in sort of the same networks of some of the same people, whether it's the, the business uh, business elite in those countries, in many ways with the revolving door of former politicians, lack of transparency, some issues in the judicial system, uh, investments in critical infrastructure that have raised some red flags sort of down the road. So I think we see some key themes emerging here. And I'd like to, at, at that point, and turn it to Romania um, to take us to uh, you know Romania, Bulgaria. Um, and you, know, you describe, uh, so I think there's, there's some interesting differences between these two cases. You anchor both of these two countries and how they look at this through, to some degree, their your Atlantic affiliation, membership in NATO, and frankly concerns about uh, a neighbor, you know, closer closer by in Russia, and how that sort of frames some of their thinking. Um, but you, the way I read your paper is describing a context of what I would call buyer's remorse about important examples of Chinese investors in these countries, perhaps in the Bulgarian side more in the private sector in the sense that this just wasn't in many ways, these investments as Nina described, didn't quite work out, that the, the markets weren't quite a fit, different cultural differences. In Romania, I got a sense it was more regret on behalf of the new PNL government when they came to power a couple of years ago and reoriented Romania's uh, foreign policy a little bit. But can you give us a sense as to, you know, what's gone wrong in this story? What explains the souring of the commercial relationship between these two countries and China and how would you frame the corrosive capital uh, context there. And then once we've done these overviews, we'll start to talk about these recommendations in a little more detail. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, so the main trend um, that we identify in Bulgaria and Romania is that the influx of Chinese corrosive capital and the accompanying deterioration of governance uh, standards in both Bulgaria and Romania are generally somewhat lesser in scope than in the countries of the Western Balkans and uh, Central Europe, as we have heard from Maciej and uh, Nina. Um, so in the Bulgarian case, all of this is conditioned by the wider uh, framework of Sofia's political and economic relations with uh, Beijing. And on the one hand, we can say that indeed uh, in the past years, there, there has been an upsurge in uh, political activity and desire for the intense of bilateral ties with China. And also interestingly, uh, pro-Russian local networks have been especially active in uh, promoting Chinese influence in the country. Um, nevertheless, uh, there has been an absence of a concerted and consistent political uh, strategy in Bulgaria and also an economic assessment of what would be gained, but above all lost from uh, intensified economic ties with China. So all of that has generally circumscribed uh, uh, ties between Bulgaria and China. Um, Romania, for its part, has traditionally and historically been uh, much more wary of foreign authoritarian influence, especially in the face of Russia. And I think that now we can see this being replicated uh, in Romania's relations with uh, China in that uh, there has been a much more determined political pushback against Beijing's economic activities in the country. And uh, a few notable examples stand out, for example, the uh, Bucharest government has signed a memorandum that limits the award of uh, public procurement contracts, especially in infrastructure to companies that uh, come from countries that do not have a bilateral trade agreement with the EU and so uh, primarily with China in mind. 
Uh, also, Romania has uh, blocked the use of Huawei equipment for the construction of its uh, 5G uh, network. Um, and uh, also, it has uh, uh, ceased cooperation with China on building a nuclear power plant in uh, Chernobyl, which had been going on since 2013. Uh, so overall, we can say that there are uh, some differences between uh, Bulgaria and Romania, which have to do with the overall character of their uh, relationship and uh, attitude to foreign authoritarian uh, states. And uh, Romania has uh, shown a much more decisive response to uh, limiting Chinese uh, activities in the country. But nevertheless, there have been uh, important similarities between the two countries. And most of all, it has to do with the priority that uh, Bulgaria and Romania place on their EU and NATO frameworks of relations when it comes to uh, ties and orientation to third countries. So uh, at the end of the day, and eventually, Bulgaria and Romania do come around to uh, EU and NATO policies um, on China. Also, uh, in terms of um, societal perception in both Bulgaria and Romania, uh, there has been a much more uh, limited understanding and uh, knowledge of China. So there are broadly positive outlooks towards that uh, country, but in both Bulgaria and Romania, uh, a more intensive knowledge of uh, China is missing. So cultural distance does matter both uh, societally, but also when it comes to uh, doing business and how businessmen conduct uh, their activities in uh, China. Um, so uh, when um, Chinese investments uh, are realized, uh, in both countries. Uh, the major cases of Chinese corrosive capital are usually observed in a number of main uh, economic sectors, including uh, agriculture, um, manufacturing, um, also um, infrastructure and energy. And just uh, the general trend regarding all those cases of corrosive um, uh, capital is that first of all, they typically lead to uh, financial loss there is usually little improvement in the uh, local industrial capacity and also there is little improvement in the labor, uh, local in, uh, employment market. So there is hardly any uh, rise in uh, wages or uh, employment in Bulgaria and Romania as a result of China's activities. And just uh, briefly, um, uh, a few examples. In the previous decade, in the uh, 2010s, the Bulgarian company started producing the Great Wall uh, motor uh, uh, car brand in Bulgaria. But uh, there was, again, a very little impact on local uh, industrial capacity since the car parts were uh, produced in uh, China, but only assembled in Bulgaria. Also, in terms of Chinese investments in agriculture, again, uh, China started buying up uh, land, uh, agricultural land in Bulgaria for farming purposes. But since there was no um, immediate profitability, the Chinese withdrew with there being uh, little effect on the um, local economy. And also, finally, just a final uh, example, it is important to say that um, uh, China's uh, pledges of investment or actual investments can pose a significant national uh, security risk. And uh, here I have in mind uh, China's interest in developing con the Constanza uh, port on the Black Sea, which is uh, Romania's biggest port on the Black Sea, and also its uh, uh, investment uh, in the development and reconstruction of the Varna port which is Bulgaria's largest port on the uh, Black Sea. So in both cases, whether realized as in Varna or still planned as in Constanza, this represents a security uh, risk since uh, these ports are part of critical um, naval infrastructure of NATO, defense exercises take place there, and also Varna is host to uh, NATO's coordination center, uh, uh, which uh, monitors the security situation in the in the Black Sea. So uh, overall, um, we can say that uh, in addition to all those negative ramifications from uh, China's investments in Bulgaria and Romania, it is um, important to point out that uh, Chinese investors usually 
uh, take a very small entrepreneurial risk and the majority of the capital has to be provided by the uh, Bulgarian or uh, Romanian side. And basically this allows uh, Chinese investors to uh, withdraw very quickly when they do not see the realization of uh, quick profit and or when they have to um, commit more uh, resources. Thanks much, Romano, for that for that overview. And I see some questions coming in uh, in the panel, which are including a good one we just got in the Three Seas Initiative that I want to come to in just a moment because I think it's really germane in terms of thinking about the framing on this. And you know, as we just close with Romano uh, and her intervention, SIPE has has been working at looking at the Three Seas Initiative and also the constructive capital, which is we try to frame this in a different paradigm, right? So you've got gross capital and the negative impact that it has, but you know, I think for both politicians, for, for business associations, they want to hear what the alternative is. And so we've been focusing on, in Bulgaria, I think with your former uh, colleagues, Romana, looking at how to improve the constructive capital environment in Bulgaria, because I think a common thread, at least in, in Nina's paper and Romana's, is sort of difficulties of these countries in attracting credible foreign investment and the need for some reforms within the local business context to improve the investment environment so that businesses and governments aren't sort of lunging after uh, money with questionable connections. And, and I know, you know 3C is very much fits into the vision and context of what this is supposed to be sort of one response, democratic response to the Belt and Road. And next week we'll be in Sofia uh, with CSD and President Radev to, to launch a, peer, a paper looking at some findings of the constructive capital environment in Bulgaria. We're really looking forward to bringing our site presence down to, to Bulgaria for that. So let me just start, we'll come to the 3C's question in a moment, but I want to unpack some of the recommendations. And I want to ask, each of you, you outline a series of recommendations, but as I mentioned, a lot of overlap about transparency, about initiatives the business community take, can take on, you know, anti-corruption pledges or, or need for business ethics, um, whistleblower policies. There's a whole range of different recommendations that where we see commonalities. But I want to ask, and maybe each of you, maybe you go back in the order we came with, Bavache, starting with you. You know, what is the most important set of you know, re reforms that's been done to address the corrosive capital project in the public or in the private sector? And what's the work that in your mind is, sits at the top of the priority list of what's left to be done? We can go Maciej, Nina, and, and, uh, and Romena addressing that question. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so basically, I think our strongest weapon in dealing with this problem is actually relying on what, what Europe or the generally transatlantic uh, area is good at. And that is relying on the, the principles of open society, good governance, and transparency. Um, for a lot of the specific measures that I'll go into uh, later, uh, I, I think we already have a quite good uh, groundwork uh, in place because we've seen that, for example, Central and Eastern European region has already gone, in, gone through tremendous transformation to deal with the problems of uh, uh, post-communist transformation, dealing with the domestic corruption, etc., and, and uh, dealing with crisis of capital uh, sourced from authoritarian countries like China is an extension of these problems where we can basically uh, look at a lot of the measures that uh, we have in place and maybe work uh, with them into sort of retrofitting them and improving them in a way that they would be uh, better suited to deal with this external uh, problem as well rather than purely internal uh, sources of, of corruption and kleptocracy. Um, and actually, you know, this, is, this comes at a time when we see that there is a big drive for anti kleptocracy policy coming out of the U.S. And, and here, I think we can have a very good cooperation between U.S. and Central Eastern European countries on this kind of uh, kind of agenda. Uh, but going on into the more more specifics, uh, let's say we can uh, divide the uh, measures that it would be uh, nice to have in place into three distinct um, areas, like the measures targeted really at the business sector, those targeted in the at the NGO, media, academic sector, and uh, lastly, uh, really uh, legal measures that uh, the government should uh, should take. Um, let me kick off with the business aspect of, of the of the thing. Um, and, and you know, we, as I mentioned in my uh, original um, intervention, we, we've seen that oftentimes, at least in case of Slovakia and Czech Republic, the drivers of uh, currency capital influx were actually private businesses. And, and so we need to work uh, with the private sector on addressing this issue by, for example, improving their internal compliance mechanism, promoting this kind of culture of accountability within the business organization, 
promoting uh, whistleblower regimes, uh, which is a big topic currently in, in Europe with a recently adopted uh, directive of, on whistleblowing, which should be transposed by uh, a deadline that's coming pretty soon. Um, and so, so, for example, we should work uh, with uh, business councils to promote this kind of uh, idea that, that, that uh, employees should be aware that there is something as uh, corrosive capital and they, when they are uh, looking into uh, let's say doing some internal monitoring or internal compliance work they should be aware that the that the corrosive capital is a specific problem that exists alongside this typical problem that it might be uh, dealing with such as corruption graft uh, mis misuse of, uh, of funding and these kind of things um, of course, there's also a more proactive role that the businesses can have in this regard, and that's actually offering support for a lot of the great work that, it, that investigative journalists were doing around the region, which are who are often cash trapped on doing this kind of work because uh, we see the media are dealing with the problem of falling falling revenues, and then there's really not enough funding for the this kind of investigative work that's really resource in, in, intensive usually. Um, when it comes to, to NGOs and academia, there is, I think that there is a very uh, good uh, opportunity for their collaboration actually with businesses on raising uh, awareness about the problems that we are, we are discussing. So, uh, so maybe it would be uh, a viable option for businesses to engage with the, with the China watching community to provide them some sort of insights on uh, what are the specific problems when it comes to doing business with China, what are the security issues that they should be aware of and, and, and provide good uh, let's say a uh, very important input into devising some sort of uh, company specific countermeasures to prevent abuse of this kind of business ties. Uh, of course, this uh, NGO and academic sector is not without its own problems as, as I've hi highlighted in the beginning. So of course, uh, this sector itself needs to improve its transparency standards. Uh, so, so for example, we, in the academic sector, which is publicly funded, we, we see that there's a need, for example, to improve transparency of various contractual relationship with Chinese partners who provide funding and then really provide information on uh, what kind of work this kind of funding is used. Uh, lastly, when it comes to government and uh, uh, of course this kind of this uh, overall light motif of, of transparency can and, and, and public participation can uh, be translated into several areas where we can see uh, governmental intervention. So, so very important aspect is improving the transparency of corporate governance structures uh, with this kind of uh, ultimate beneficial ownership transparency. Uh, we see, uh, and we see that there is a really a lot of push on this in the Euro-Atlantic area. So with the recent addition to the US on a corporate transparency registry, European AML laws, but, but one, there's one specific flaw that these uh, registries and uh, repositories have, and that there is a very poor uh, data verification and that uh, it doesn't really cost the companies that much to lie on who are they actually owned by. Um, so, so, so maybe there's an inspiration on this that we can learn from Slovakia here, that, which created a very strict UBO regime in order to specifically to deal with the problem of shell corporation and uh, owned by local oligarchs. Uh, which would, which basically uh, uh, means that these companies alone cannot make the declarations about who are their beneficial owners, but rather independent third parties have to verify that. And the companies in question uh, are facing very strict sanctions if they should be found uh, that they are not providing uh, true information by being barred actually from public contracts for several years, which creates a strong incentive for, for providing true data on who you are owned. Um, of course, among the more traditional uh, issues, we see uh, still the need to finalize FDI screening adoptions across the region. Not all countries have done this yet. Uh, for example, in Slovakia, we are still in the process of preparing the, the legislation. Uh, but, but there's maybe uh, one issue where we can make, uh, where overall the re region or the EU wide, we can look into how to make the FDI screening regimes more robust. And that's actually maybe allowing a public participation in the process in some way by, by allowing uh, NGOs to uh, provide input into these screening mechanisms in order to deal with the general uh, problem of enforcement gap. And uh, oftentimes we see there's also a problem uh, with gatekeeping in uh, the government organizations that, uh, that have the power to initiate or not to initiate the screening procedures, which of course is a huge corruption risk. Um, similarly, we should also maybe learn from countries like, like Lithuania that were recently dealing with uh, procurement screenings because 
oftentimes we neglect these kind of purchase uh, contracts and rather focus only on investment. But but if we are purchasing sensitive technologies, uh, this can be a problem. So so again, a similar mechanism like FDI screening should be put in place for procurements. And uh, the big issue in Czech Republic, especially, was the issue with the revolving door, uh, where we see uh, politicians going to Chinese companies and then back again into politics or or executive roles in the government. Um, and we actually see that, that the, throughout the region, we have very weak uh, revolving door policies in place, very weak lobbying the regulations in place. And this is something that needs to be uh, be dealt with. So, so for example, in case of Slovakia and Czech Republic, the revolving door is really for a very short time uh, period, has only very short cooling off periods and only regards employment in companies that have specifically benefited from the regulatory action of your previous employer. So, so for example, if your ministry offered state aid to a company, that company would not be able to hire you, but it does not deal with the bigger picture problem of being uh, hired by, uh, for example, Chinese or Russian companies that have direct or indirect ties to the government and are used as policy vectors uh, rather than purely uh, business-oriented uh, organizations. Great, thanks much. And I know we're, we're running short about 10 minutes here to close and I do wanna address the three C's questions. So maybe Nina, Romana, I'll just sort of throw that same question to you, but just in brief, you know, what's yeah. the most important recommendation you've seen that's been done? What's what's left to be done in your mind? I think Croatia has done something uh, when it comes to addressing whistleblowing and offering protection to the whistleblowers. And, you know, in terms of upkeeping ethical standards, it did some improvement in the field of the rule of law and also in terms of judiciary procedures and so on, and also some baby steps when it comes to corruption. Uh, however, I think the most important thing that is to be done is to enhance the overall business and investment environment because when the businesses in Croatia will stop feeling um, this need to, to raise capital from abroad, that they will have enough business offers on the table, they will also engage with a more reliable investor. So I would say that uh, these so increase, so again, putting more, more um, resources into combating corruption, but also addressing lobbying. Lobbying is not regulated, neither in Croatia, neither in Slovenia, likely also in other countries of, in this part of Europe. And I, I think in, for the hope for this improvement, I see it the most on the local level, um, where we see this emergence, we see that people are stuffed with the same uh, local oligarchs and local politicians. And we see these new faces that are independent, that are activists coming up uh, in, term, in also in the political uh, department, right? We see that in Zagreb recently, where the mayor is now a really young, fresh face that did a lot of cuts when it comes to corruption and when it comes to separating the local administration from private businesses a little bit. So I would say that a very major um, role here could be played by supporting by the civil society, which, which needs to be further supported in Croatia. So raising this awareness that, yeah, that we can do something and the changes can be possible. So just in brief. Thanks, Nina. Remember? Thank you. Uh, the Three Cs initiative is certainly crucial and fundamental when it comes to devising uh, new ways of countering Chinese influence and increasing uh, competitiveness in the region and economic development and connectivity, both infrastructural and digital. And I think the challenge for countries like Bulgaria is to actually devise projects that are competitive and can therefore be funded and also to create uh, meaningful links with other countries from the region Region because uh, it should not just be nationally focused projects, but also wider regional projects. So the challenge here is to find the right formula to be competitive and show uh, higher value added. Um, now, when it comes to the uh, political level, I, Bulgaria finds itself in a very peculiar situation in that it hasn't had a government uh, for a long time now. And I would say I would frame it as this tug of war between the status quo and change. And we still don't know how it is going to play out. And the problem, problem I think, in, in this situation is that there is a lot of 
um, inward focus, uh, a lot of focus on domestic issues, on tackling the most immediate political problems and basically how to form a government. And so unfortunately, foreign policy issues and such fundamental questions as Chinese influence uh, get much less attention. But of course, the world uh, is moving. And uh, while we are being focused on domestic issues is a problem. So. Uh, in general, Bulgaria on the political level has to focus on tackling state capture networks. But in the meantime, I will just briefly focus on the fundamental role of business in the civil society, if I have time. So in terms of business, four main um, recommendations. Uh, first, it is uh, absolutely uh, paramount for a culture of an entrepreneurship to continue to be developed in Bulgaria and Romania. Unfortunately, in a range of global indices and rankings, the intention and expectation from starting a new enterprise are extremely low uh, in Bulgaria. So entrepreneurial businesses that do exist uh, actually have a, a responsibility to upcoming generations of young entrepreneurs to socialize them into uh, values of self-reliance, transparency, and social responsibility, because I think this is a key buffer against the practices that uh, emanate from authoritarian states and corrosive capital flow, such as corruption. Uh, secondly, it is uh, very important for businesses to continue to build their innovation uh, capacity, because this is basically the only, I would say, primary way for Bulgaria and Romania to become high value added economies and also competitive regionally uh, and in this way also businesses can uh, participate in cross-EU uh, networks of innovation and compete against um, China's technological advance. Uh, then, uh, thirdly, uh, businesses um, in a way should go local, uh, by which I mean that the majority of uh, the Bulgarian businesses that are successful operate internationally because in this way they can, uh, uh, they do not have to focus on dealing with oligarchic, oligopolistic ne networks domestically, but uh, I think that still they have this responsibility to promote the wider application of good corporate uh, and ethical standards uh, within the country. And then fourthly, uh, businesses should strive for an enhanced uh, social impact, which means contributing to uh, sustainable community development, including through the implementation of vital projects such as infrastructural ones, which are of uh, actual benefit to the local population so that there is no um, demand and acceptance of Chinese-led uh, uh, infrastructural projects. And I think I will stop here. Thanks, Romeda. You've given us a long list of, uh, of homework where we hope that uh, Cybe working with its, its partners can help contribute to some of these recommendations in the business space. I, I know Romina touched briefly upon the three C's question. Well, we have a couple of minutes left. I know Croatia was, at least under the previous leadership, quite a driver of 3SI. Uh, Mace, uh, I know the Czech and Slovak governments, I think, are the last two that have contributed to the three C's fund. So I don't know, but I wondered if you wanted to tackle that question of you know, BRIs. Out here, uh, we heard the Estonians really try to frame 3SI as sort of a democratic alternative. Um, I wanted to see if you wanted to address sort of the question that comes through here. How do you see 3SI playing a role in combating corrosive capital? And can 3SI meet the development of members if it's need and shut down corrosive capital? Maybe quickly address that and then we'll close. Okay. Um, so one thing to know that here is that for sure uh, 3C initiatives can be a factor in combating corrosive capital in uh, Central Eastern Europe, but it will not be a panacea because as we have outlined, these issues with the corrosive capital are not only an, only issues about uh, the uh, offer of funding or, or demand for funding, but also issues about governance and, and, uh, and the legal environment and uh, and values of the society. So, so uh, of course, it can play a role in a way that it provides an alternative source of funding uh, for for a project that needs uh, this kind of um, in input of money. But as Rumina said, it is, this is really an issue that that oftentimes a lot of the projects that are funded by Kyrgyz capital are are not, not economically non feasible projects, which under good governance principles for which three seed initiative stands uh, might not get funding. Uh, so, so there will be there will remain this kind of probably demand for more cursive capital um, as a source of uh, plan B for uh, the less feasible, less economically feasible projects. And and this is a really an issue to tackle. And I don't have a, an answer for this one uh, just yet, and, and because it's really a big bigger problem. 
Um, secondly, and, and that's what I've been uh, thinking about uh, quite a lot recently uh, on whether whether the three CIS initiatives is actually a competitor or a complement to Chinese activities in Central and Eastern Europe, because when you look at this, three CIS initiative deals with more north-south connections uh, rather than east-west connections, which is uh, which falls under the Belt and Road uh, initiative. So, so in a way, these these two initiatives maybe are not really in such a direct uh, competition, which is again something that needs to be uh, resolved for a three CIS initiative to be. Um, such a such a strong input for uh, dealing with uh, currency capital. Uh, nevertheless, I think it's a it's a very uh, good initiative to deal with this uh, issue, and, and uh, hopefully uh, it will be able to grow uh, beyond this kind of uh, area of dealing with specific projects and uh, into dealing more with the uh, with the uh, governance issues and like and uh, coming up with uh, joint solutions to uh, establishing uh, the processes of good governance. Nina, do you have a quick uh, 30 seconds on that before we close? Yeah, yeah, I think that from the side of the Croatian government, they usually propose the same project to the three seas initiative and to the Chinese 17 plus one initiative. So they are pretty capable <laughs> in terms of writing capacity and proposing capacity. But I would say that these um, associations also have to set some or this, yeah, some clear rules, you know, on these matters. So I think that this might, this framework might be lacking. Um, one clear case, for example, is the gas terminal on island of Kirk or the um, Rijeka Zagreb um, railway, which was just, you know, tossed by the government from the Chinese investors to the American investors to the three seas initiatives. So I would say that also, you know, when looking at these initiatives, we have to put them maybe into more EU kind of carrot and stick framework. Yeah, this is just my perspective. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you. This has been a really great discussion and really fantastic collaboration. We're really grateful to Rumena, to Nina, uh, Tomache in particular for organizing this and for your excellent pieces. Uh, I encourage you to go to uh, our site website and CIS.eu. Both you can find the papers on both of those sites. Um, my colleague Caitlin, who I'm really grateful to for helping shepherd and run this event here, has posted the links to the papers, to the site corrosive and constructive capital website, ways to sign up to the site newsletter so you can follow our activities here as our Europe office continues to pick up its activities and work on many of these recommendations. We hope in all these countries that uh, that our panelists have addressed. So thank you and thanks to my colleagues, uh, Justin Witowski, Stanislav Stakova for helping throughout this series and for this event. Really grateful to all of you for joining. Um, thanks for taking the time. Stay tuned for additional site events here out of our Europe office and globally and uh, look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you.